Hello there, I'm Dark Shades and I just wanted to say hi and thank you for subscribing. Um, I wanted to talk today about ending relationships and COVID in particular, this period during COVID has caused the end of a lot of relationships. A lot of times it was on the cards for people to break up and it was they were just in denial. And in other um, situations, it's just an accumulation of all the stresses that come with COVID, why people feel they're better off going alone. So what is it when we, um, when one party in particular tells us that it's over? How does that make us feel? Well, it all depends on our history. How many times has it happened before? Have we always, have we got a history of rejection? Have we got a history of partners leaving us? Because if we do, that's going to impact the way we feel. We're going to start feeling worthless. We're going to feel as though we're to blame, as though we're not good enough. And all of these kind of thoughts are going to come into your mind if it's happened to you more than once before. But the funny thing is, is that it's hard to say not to take it personally, but sometimes we just make bad choices. Sometimes we cannot know what's going on in the mind of a third party. Well, not even a second party. We can't know what people are thinking. We can't know when feelings change. And when sometimes people, we live in such a polite society that when people aren't happy, they're afraid to tell the person or they don't know how to tell the person that they're not happy. So, and especially if they've made promises in the past, you do get at the begin, beginning of relationships, oh, you're the best thing I've ever met. Oh, you're my lifetime partner. Oh, I'm never going to leave you. We're going to be in this together through thick and thin. And that's why people get married. People get married because they promise to be together through sickness and in health. Is that, a, is that a feasible? Is that realistic? Is it realistic to make that promise when you don't know what's going to happen down the road? But it's realistic if you're committed and if, that is, if your makeup is such that if you make a promise, you're going to keep it. We have some people who are very honest, very loyal, very reliable. And when those people have been betrayed or hurt or they've been investing in a relationship and then that relationship or their partner in that relationship is like, oh, it's over because they're non-committal. Oh, it's over. Um, I want to go by myself. They're not think they're thinking about themselves and I don't know, can you blame someone for thinking about themselves? I mean, you can't always be thinking about the other person. So it's a very tricky one, because on the one hand, you've got someone who's invested their time, their love, their whatever it is into a relationship. And then you've got someone who's kind of taken that for granted and thinks, oh, well, you know, it was, you know, it was good while it lasted. I want to move on. And it causes a lot of animosity and upset and it just, people just don't understand. The person who has invested the time just doesn't understand how it could have gone wrong, what it could have gone wrong. A lot of us, when men tell us, oh, you know, you're the woman I want, me now I left you, me want be with you forever, me I got married you, and all that, they actually believe it. And they don't take into account that feelings can change and people change. And we know that happens. People aren't so committed as they used to be. We still have some, but people aren't as committed. And as soon as the tide changes, they've gone with the tide. And it makes people feel unstable and unsettled and unhappy and very, very disappointed. It also make it also affects future relationships because you're going to start thinking, well, if he said all that to me and if he treated me like that and if we did all this together and he can go off, that means, you know, the next person I meet, how can I rely on them? How can I trust them? 
But we have to learn that we are the masters of our own destiny. We can't control anyone. And there are some people who say, I can't let you go. I don't want you to leave me. And it is kind of degrading to have to beg someone to stay with you. But you do have people who do that. And then what happens is the other party ends up disrespecting them. And then they end up ending the relationship anyway. And it would have been better if they ended the relationship without feeling degraded. Because when you don't want someone to leave you, you know why that is. You know it's because maybe you've introduced them to your family, your friends, your children. You realise the impact it's going to have when that relationship breaks up. You don't want that to happen. So you might you, you would try to keep it together. And a lot of people do. It might sound like they're begging. But really, they just want to keep the relationship together. And that's not that's not a um, hard ask when you've spent several years with an individual. They aren't just going to want to throw in the towel. They are going to try and do everything that they can to keep it together. Whether it works or not, well, that is a different question. Um, sometimes it's different, the age different. I mean, if you break up with somebody like you're young, like, you know, if, when I was young, if, some, if I broke up with somebody, it was like, no big deal. As you get older, it becomes a bit more, you, you're supposed to make more responsible choices once for the first thing. I mean, when you're young, you don't really think about the choices. It's usually physical. It's usually um, what a guy's doing for you and that kind of stuff. Well, as you get older, it's still what a guy can, how that guy can supplement you and how you how you can work better together. But I think as you get older, you're looking for somebody who's on your wavelength and who's um, financially on the same level as you, intellectually on the same level as you. So you're looking for a more compatible partner. And so when you enter into a relationship as you get older, you're more likely to think that you've got more sense and you're more likely to think that the relationship might work because you're older. But you still have people who are older but have young mentalities. So it doesn't necessarily mean that because you're older, the relationship is going to work. The only difference is, is that when you've invested a few years when you're older, you feel you're more devastated because you're thinking, who am I going to meet now? You know, I'm 50, I'm 60, I'm 70, whatever it is. It's much harder to think positively, <clears throat> to think positively when you the relationship breaks up, when you're further down in your years. The funny thing is, I'm always motivated by um, first dates. People in their 60s, 70s getting together. 80s the other day, they had someone and they hit it off. The two of them played tennis in their 80s. Bless his little heart. He looked like he could hardly walk. But, you know, he's playing tennis. And she likes the outdoor life. So they were fantastic. So I don't, I don't think, it's hard to say that, but we can't think that as we get older, we're not going to meet anyone. We have to think about what is healthy for us, what is good for us. The partner who I'm with, can he add to my to my um, portfolio in you know in a business sense? What are, what are you both bringing to the table? And so as you get older, it's more likely to affect you because you are going to wonder whether or not, especially if you thought you were getting on great, you're going to wonder whether or not you're going to, somebody else can fill that person's shoes. So we're not, to be honest, just a word or just a suggestion. We shouldn't look for somebody who can fill someone else's shoes. We shouldn't be comparing at this stage. What we're looking for now is just somebody who is compatible and is on, we're on an even playing field, i.e., we both have a similar background, similar interest um, and stuff like that. That helps you to kind of have things in common and more likely to make the relationship last. Um, 
lack of communication that is difficult because a lot of people, like I said, you know, the relationship is going downhill. They know the relationship's going downhill. They're not quite sure how to communicate that because we live in this polite world where you don't want to rock the boat. So you're kind of ifing and ahhing and hoping they'll get the hint. They don't get the hint or some of them do get the hint. But as long as you don't say it straight to their faces, they're going to ignore it. So you have to be upfront, personal and clear and open. Um, and like, you know, when you're thinking about loss, when you break up with somebody, it's like a death. People don't think of it like that. But if you've been with somebody for a while in an intimate relationship, remember, you, you then build soul ties to that person. And you have sexual ties to that person that you don't really realise what's happening. So it's very, very difficult once you've been with somebody, intimately with someone, to break away in, in an easy fashion. It might look easy, but emotionally, um, spiritually, it's not that easy. There is something there that is holding you together until you can separate it, until you don't stop thinking about that person every day, you're not trying to get their attention in some way. You're not um, checking out their Facebook pages and stalking them. As long as you're doing all of that, you're still in a soul tie. So it's about releasing yourself from a soul tie so that you can move on. And a lot of people, they find it really difficult moving on. And so that's why there are those five stages of grief. The first one is, um, it's usually... What's it? Denial. Maybe even regret. But the denial is, is that, you know, they haven't left me. It's not over. I can't believe it's over. It's not over. Even though the person has told you it's over, you're going through the denial phase. Same with death. I, that person isn't dying. You know, they're going to come through this. You know, it's not over. And that is a similar scenario. The next one is anger. Once you realise that the person may have left you or the person has died, then you start... Let me just turn this down. Let's do this. Once you realise the person has died and they've left, you start getting angry and you start saying, how could they die? How could they leave me? You know, I'm here, especially people who've been married for years and years and years. Same with relationships. You get angry at the person. How dare he? How dare she? How dare they um, reject me? How dare they abandon me? How dare they leave me? You know, and you're going through all that anger. And then you even start, then you reach the bargaining stage. Oh, you know, I'll do anything to get you back. I'm so sorry I did this. I'm sorry I did that. I'm sorry I didn't take you seriously. I'm sorry I didn't show you love. I'm sorry I didn't appreciate you. If only if you come back, I will. I will appreciate you. I will love you. I will show you um, appreciation and all of this stuff. And you start bargaining. It's like when people die, you start saying, oh, please, God, please just give her another day. Please just give her another week. Please don't let her die now. I'll do anything. I'll, I'll you know, I'll become a Christian. I'll, I'll do this. I'll do that. People start bargaining, you know, and it's the same thing when a relationship is ending. You're, you're getting that same withdrawal symptoms. Um, and then you'll, once you realize that that person has died or that person has really, really left, you go in a bout of depression. It's really important that it's fine to be upset and a bit low, but it's not good to stay in that state of mind. But depression comes next normally, and it depends on you how long you get depressed for. And it is about it being realistic. There is no time frame for grief. So you can't say, oh, you can grieve or be depressed for like a week or two weeks or a month or six months or a year or two years. It's an individual thing. But you just have to set yourself a time limit and say, OK, after six months, I'm going to get myself together. I'm going to get myself back in the steps, in the saddle. I'm going to dust myself off and start all over again. And you, you determine that after that period, you've allowed yourself to wallow. Um, and you set that period, but you make sure after that period, you actually say, well, now I'm going to get back into the swing of things. And then last, you reach acceptance. You reach a stage where you finally say, yes, 
My mother has died. She has gone. I'll never see her again in the same way. You know, I feel her inside, but, you know, she's gone. The same way, like, when a relationship is over, you kind of think, well, that person isn't going to be back in my life. I just have to hold on to the memories. And, you know, I hope that at some point we will be able to have a civil conversation. Or maybe not. Sometimes it's not even good to have people as friends because it just reminds you of, you know, things that went wrong and why it didn't work. So sometimes it is best to keep it apart, but it's an individual choice. And that's all for now. Hope you found it helpful. Bye bye.